Hi, everyone. In this episode, we delve into chilling accounts of creatures so bizarre and elusive that they will challenge your understanding of the natural world. Bundle up as we hear the chilling details, examine the evidence, and attempt to unravel the truth behind these enigmatic creatures. So, if you're in it to win it, please squash that subscribe button and let's get into the stories. As a reporter, I know better than anyone that stories are living things. They shift and change every time they're told, sometimes becoming something far bigger than the original event that sparked them. That is the nature of this bizarre tale I've been chasing after, the one I want to share with you. It was around mid-September, on a crisp day in West Virginia when I first got wind of it. There was a sighting reported in a small town that sits in a hollow surrounded by hills and the smooth waters of the Ohio River. Since I started working in journalism, I'd heard a few whispers about cryptic sightings around these parts, some of which referred to the creature known as the Mothman, an unfathomable human-like figure said to live in the darkness of night. Most of the reported sightings were near the old bridge that looms on the outskirts of town. The town had a scattering of eyewitness reports, and I found each of them to be genuinely terrifying. These reports had me wondering if there was any truth to what was being said. The idea of covering the Mothman story was not simply another assignment for me. I could feel an electric charge in the idea of it. The prospect of capturing footage of this real-life mythical creature held an excitement I could feel in my bones. It was almost like I was on a Scooby-Doo adventure. I didn't expect to actually confront a mythical creature, but just to find out whatever was causing the sightings. I hoped that I could be the one to finally shed light on this creature, to present an undisputed account of what it really is that might lay the rumors to rest. The night before the encounter, I nosedived into my work, tracking local stories, identifying patterns, and interviewing witnesses who were willing to talk. I spent hours on the dusty roads surrounding the town, filming what I could of the landscape. It was good footage for a scary story. Many of the locals, being superstitious, spoke in hushed tones about the Mothman. Their accounts were often chilling, but they wanted to share them. Whether the Mothman was real or not, these people certainly believed they had seen it. As night fell, I felt a prickle of anticipation. Nighttime was when the creature was said to make its appearances. Tonight, I felt like I would be the hunter of truth, tracking down a story like no other. But little did I know, this adventure would be a story that would forever change my life. From where I was standing, I could see the old bridge the moonlight highlighting the decay and the years of neglect, my camera was set up, ready for anything I might see. The evening was brisk, typical of mid-September, yet it held an unnatural silence that seemed to sink into my bones. As I was exploring the area, something caught me off guard. Breaking the stillness, I heard a sound, as soft as a whisper. I swiveled towards the noise, my heart pounding in adrenaline-fueled anticipation. There, against the darkness of night, was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. It was dark and shadow-like. I would guess it to be roughly six feet tall, with expansive wings black as coal spreading out almost double its height. Before I could think, I aimed the camera. The red recording light was clicked on. It was a scene straight from a fantasy film. As my eyes fought to find it, the creature honed into focus. Its body was extremely humanoid, muscular even. It had a pair of long, massive wings glistening black in the moonlight. But that wasn't the strangest part. The creature had no face. None at all. At least, not one I could see. There was just a pair of glowing red eyes that seemed fixated on me. Those eyes were magnetic, casting an impenetrable gaze that I was helpless against. I felt nailed to the ground, unable to look away. The creature's wings unfurled and beat against the air with a force that echoed through the quiet night. It shifted restlessly, letting out a low, thunderous sound. At that exact moment, the reality of it all dawned hard on me. The stories were real. Quickly, I steadied the camera, focused the lens, and tried to record as much as possible. Just as abruptly as it had appeared, the creature spread its massive wings, reeling back before launching itself into the sky. 
vanishing almost instantly. The dark sky swallowed up the beast, leaving behind no evidence of the encounter. I was astounded, astounded that I finally had proof of the elusive Mothman. I replayed the footage I had captured, the burning red eyes, the humanoid body, all of it proof of something beyond our understanding. I had done it. I had captured the elusive creature on camera. I thought this would be the story to make my career, but in the end, it wasn't. My footage was dismissed as fake and no one in the industry would take me seriously after that. Maybe your listeners will be a little more understanding in the knowledge that there are unknown creatures sharing our world with us. Denying their existence doesn't make them go away. Not at all. It just makes us ignorant. But there's my story. I hope there is someone out there who will benefit from it. God knows I'm still trying. Let me share with you an experience of mine that quite honestly baffles me to this day and still sends a cold shiver down my spine whenever I think about it. It happened to me a few years back. I've always loved deep diving into cave exploration. There's just something about strapping on a helmet, flicking on the headlamp and descending into the belly of the earth that has always called to me. Perhaps it's the blend of fear and exhilaration that gets my adrenaline pumping. I was in Kentucky at the time, in a particular cave system that was known for its complexity and intricate rock formations. This wasn't my first time out there, but for some reason, I had this strange feeling in my gut that day, like I was heading into something unknown and uncertain. I said my little prayer, checked my gear one last time, and with a quick reassuring nod to myself, I began my descent into the awaiting darkness. The entry was tight, and narrow, but it soon opened up into a wide chamber with stalactites hanging down like gothic chandeliers. The light from my headlamp danced on the pale, wet surfaces and made the walls appear to shimmer. It was eerily beautiful. If you've never been spelunking, you can't imagine how quiet it gets once you're down there. It's so quiet you could literally hear your own heartbeat in the depth of the silence. It's just as intriguing as it is terrifying. The deeper I went, the more enthralling the formations became. There were twisting spirals of minerals jutting out from the cave walls, formed over countless years by the persistent droplets of water, each adding its own minute contribution to the formation. Other chambers contained curtains of delicate, fluted formations draped from the ceiling and walls. Various minerals painted the walls in hues of reds, oranges, and whites, creating a hallucinatory palette in the otherwise bluish glow of my lamp. I was making my way through one of the tighter sections of the cave, crawling on all fours. I was squeezed between a floor of rock and a low, jagged ceiling. I felt the cold, moist air brush against the exposed skin of my neck and hands. My heart pounded in anticipation. As I crawled deeper, navigating by the beam of light cutting through the thick darkness, I heard something. Now, sound in a cave is a rare occurrence, but this wasn't a drip of water or a loose pebble clinking down a rocky slope. It was something else. It was a noise unlike anything I had ever heard before. It was a strange clicking noise echoing through the chambers. I couldn't place it, but it sounded so alien down there, like it didn't belong. My heart rate quickened and my grip tightened around the edges of the rocks. What began as an abnormal clicking noise now grew in volume. It sounded almost biological, as if something was making that sound intentionally. But what could crawl around on the cave floor and produce such a noise? Reality hit me as the clicking became louder. It became clear I wasn't alone in there. I felt a chill run down my spine and my mind started racing. Maybe I should turn back. But there wasn't anything down there that could hurt me. Sure, I would run into the occasional bat, but contrary to popular belief, there aren't many animals that make their homes in caves. I wanted to know what the hell was making that clicking sound in these deep, dark parts of the cave. I figured it might be some underground stream or another earthly formation, but that, unfortunately, was not the case. I started to hear a scratching sound. That wasn't my heart pounding in my chest anymore. It was something frighteningly real echoing through the tunnels. 
the reality of my situation hit me in a wave that seemed to suck the air out of me. I had a brief thought to turn around, but I didn't even get the time to consider it. My flashlight beam reflected off something down the tunnel, something alive. It was pale and gaunt, so different from a human and yet eerily similar. It was on all fours, its movements not quite crawling, but not walking either. It was fast, too damn fast. I held my breath and trying to keep my shaking hand steady, focused the light on its face. Its eyes, they were so dark they seemed to devour the light. There was no discernible nose across its face and its mouth was as black and cavernous as its eyes. It looked like a skull if not for the thin layer of pale skin stretched across it. I could only watch it for a moment before I turned tail and made a run for it. Shooting to my feet, I pushed myself against the cavern wall and bolted towards the way I'd come. I could hear the beast behind me, its clicking growing increasingly frantic with the chase. My heart pounded in my ears, each echo reverberating and mocking my slowly dwindling hope of escape. I stumbled a few times on unseen rocks, my hands frenziedly searching the darkness ahead. The noise seemed to be right behind me now. My mind screamed at me to go faster as I crawled, scrambled, and slid my way back. As I resurfaced into the welcoming chill of the night air, a sense of relief washed over me. I was out of its clutches, out of that horrifying darkness. Once I was sure I had left the terror behind, I turned off the flashlight and sat panting on the moist grass, staring at the mouth of the cave. I swear, for a brief second, I could hear the subdued clicking before it finally vanished altogether. That night replayed through my dreams for weeks. That creature's large, black eyes became a thing of my nightmares. And yet, each time I woke up in a sweat, my heart pounding in my chest, there was a part of me that yearned for the chemical taste of fear and adrenaline. To my fellow spelunkers out there, cherish the quiet you find in the caves, but listen well. You never know what might be lurking just beyond the beam of your headlamp. I think you learn something new from every encounter. From this one, I learned to always trust my gut and to respect the unknown. But don't get me wrong, I'm not about to hang up my caving gear. The fear, the curiosity, it's intoxicating to me. The night may have scarred me, but did not defeat me. I will say, however, if I ever hear that clicking sound coming from the darkness, well, I'm not about to stick around and meet the beast again. It had been a month since I'd retired as a firefighter and moved out from the crowded, busy city of New York to peaceful, serene Wasaic in upstate New York. It was somewhere towards the end of May when I finally decided to fully dedicate myself to restore an old Victorian home that I'd become charmed by. The house initially belonged to a high-status official and was historically significant to the tiny town of Wasaic. My fascination with history and the unique charm of owning a Victorian house delighted me. I envisioned myself as scraping away the layers of time to bring back its former glory. Upon my decision to renovate, my days were instantly tied up doing small repairs on the house here and there. The charming antique fixtures needed some replacements, but I planned on keeping the original bits wherever possible. As I immersed myself in my dream project, I started to notice certain odd happenings around the house. Nothing crazy, but just strange enough to make you raise an eyebrow. Maybe I missed city noise, or maybe my solitude was starting to talk to me, but I often found muffled whispers in the silence that would stop instantly when I tried to trace them. Sometimes, I'd feel a sudden drop in temperature, chilling me to the bone, only to return to normal in seconds. Rattling sounds would sometimes clang through the old radiator pipes. I shrugged it off as just the happenings of an old house. However, it wasn't only my sense of sound and touch that was being played with, but even smell. On a few occasions, while I was stirring through the dusty memories locked up tight in that house, the definite scent of tobacco would waft around me. It would linger briefly and then just disappear into thin air. I never smoked and did not know anyone within miles who did. Progress on the renovation was steady, but the peculiar incidents were now 
a common occurrence. However, the charm of the house and my relentless determination to restore it always overshadowed my mental debates and stopped me from probing further into these oddities. Except one night, everything changed. It was a regular night, filled with its usual dose of peculiar yet harmless incidents. It was late, and I had been grappling with the stubborn ancient faucet in the main bathroom. Suddenly, I dropped my wrench with a loud clatter after being startled by a strange creaking noise coming from the corridor outside. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end as I got the distinct feeling of being watched. An inexplicable dread seeped into me. The old brass chandelier in the hall began flickering, casting eerie shadows around the room. I chalked that up to the house's outdated circuitry, but deep down, I knew something else was at play. As I cautiously emerged from the bathroom, I felt a rush of cold air that sucked the warmth from my bones. I shivered, trying to shake off the unease, but it was as if the house itself was breathing, pulsing with unseen energy. The relics from my renovation projects, all my tools, old photographs, and antique trinkets were strewn about in disarray, as if moved by invisible hands. Even the clumsy old grandfather clock in the corner, which hadn't worked since I set foot in the house, was ticking back to life with an unnerving rhythm. Suddenly, I spotted a hazy figure at the end of the corridor, transparent and almost appearing to be floating. It was imperceptible at first, a mere shadow-like outline. But as I squinted, I could identify a roughly human shape. It had hollow eyes that glowed with a dim light. For a face, there was only a translucent blur, like watercolor smeared on wet paper. Its form appeared ethereal, as though it were created from the wisps of a morning fog. No chains clinked and no terrifying moans echoed through the hallway. The figure seemed as surprised to see me as I was to see it. Scared out of my wits, I stuttered out a hello. To my surprise, the figure's glow flickered as if acknowledging my presence. In the silence that followed, I sensed a sorrow from it, a reflection perhaps of a distant past. I felt a pang of sympathy. Was this spirit bound to the house somehow? Was this its home, just like it was becoming mine? I didn't know whether to flee or to reach out to it. Instead, I did something I didn't even realize was possible. I sat down right there in the hallways and began to speak. I talked about my day, my plans for the house, my dreams for it, everything I was feeling. After a while, I'm not sure exactly when the figure disappeared. I slowly got up and made my way back to bed. The eerie feeling in the house had subsided and was replaced with an odd comfort. It was a house that was lived in and loved before I came to own it. I decided to spend the following day researching the history of the house. As I delved into Old Town records and newspaper clippings, I learned of the original homeowner, a man not too different from me. He too had loved this house, cared for it, and shaped it. And perhaps he still did from the other side. My experience with the ghost has reshaped my perspective on not only the house, but the world around me. The hauntings became less menacing, the shadows less threatening. The house was not only becoming my home, but it was also somebody else's before me. And it still was. So as my renovations continue, I do so with a newfound respect for the history and stories ingrained in these old walls and the spirit that still cares for its home. Together, we're creating a new chapter in this Victorian home's rich history, even if one of us is not of the physical realm. My story is a bit of a weird one. This was the middle of July a couple of years back. I've always been into astronomy. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that I love it. The quiet of the night, the expanse of the universe, all laid out above me. It's a reminder of how small we are. Anyway, at the time, I was living in New Mexico. It's a beautiful state, and one of the great things about it is you can be in a bustling urban area and just get in your car and drive for half an hour and find yourself under a blanket of stars. Unless you're in one of the major cities, light pollution isn't really a problem out there. One night, 
I'm out north of the city and it's just beautiful. It was a real clear night with not a lot of moon, so the stars are just showing off. I've got my coffee and a blanket and I'm looking forward to a few quiet hours stargazing. I was particularly excited because there was a comet visible in the night sky at this time. I'm happily observing it, scribbling notes and sketching in my notebook, enjoying the night sky and losing track of time. Then something strange happened. At first, I paid it no mind. There are often aircraft in the area and I'd usually look, make a note in my log and get back to my stars. But this one's lights weren't the usual white, blue or red of an airplane. They were flickering in a pattern that seemed odd to me. These lights were dancing across the sky, creating sequences that, in my few years of stargazing, I had never seen. I like to pick out the path of the International Space Station as it goes by, so I'm okay at picking out man-made lights against the stars. But whatever these lights were, they were different. They moved slowly across the sky, seemingly aware they were being watched. I had to get a better look. I adjusted my telescope and tried to pinpoint these lights. The lights were spaced out in a wide circle, and they seemed to be concentrating on a specific point in the middle. A dark figure, tall and obscure. It's difficult to describe something you don't recognize. I'd have to say it looked like a shadow made solid standing in relief against the sky. Alien, strange, and utterly fascinating. I noticed a kind of motion then. The figure seemed to be swaying or moving in some kind of rhythm. I was completely transfixed and just let me say, going from looking at the immensity of the cosmos to focus on something so weirdly personal, happening right there in front of me was quite disorienting. The figure seemed to perform a dance of some sort, matching the flickering of the distant lights. It was almost hypnotic and I found myself drawn into the strange pattern. It was almost ritualistic in nature. I've got no idea how long I sat there watching as this surreal play unfolded. The lights shifted and I got a better look at the figure. It was a tall creature moving the distant grass. Although it was far off, when I zoomed in with my telescope, I got a clear view. It was a large, imposing figure that seemed almost prehistoric, like something straight out of a science fiction movie. It stood about six feet tall and was capable of walking on four legs as well as two. I could see huge, black, razor-sharp claws glistening in the moonlight. Its eyes, piercing yellow, seemed to glow in the darkness. The head of the beast was similar to a dinosaur or a large lizard. The creature continued to circle around the lights, which would flicker and shine brighter in response. My mind raced as I desperately tried to make sense of what I was seeing. Was this some unknown tribe performing an ancient and forgotten dance? Were there people out there worshipping it? Was it some sort of ancient god? Finally, after what felt like hours, the strange ritual ended. The lights flickered once more and disappeared while the large reptilian figure faded away into the darkness, leaving me alone under the now quiet starry sky. The feeling of awe and fear mixed with strange excitement was overwhelming. I packed up my stuff as quickly as I could and, without looking back, made my way to my car. That night, my dreams were filled with glowing lights and shadowy reptilian figures lurking in the darkness. A few days later, back in the safety of my living room, I started researching about what I might have witnessed. Most of the theories I found revolved around aliens or government conspiracies, nothing concrete or believable. But one did catch my eye. A hunter from the same area claimed to have seen a large, reptilian-like creature years prior. No ritual, no lights, just the creature. Did it scare me? Of course it did, but also I was undeniably curious. I haven't gone back to that spot since, but the mystery of what I saw that night hasn't left my mind. What was that creature? Was it dangerous or peaceful? I guess I'll never know, but there's a part of me hoping that my story might lead to some answers. There must be someone else out there who has seen these things and maybe, just maybe, knows what they are. This happened a few years ago, in the middle of fall. I had decided to take a camping trip. 
around the Great Lakes region. My buddies were neck deep in domestic life, so I chose to go solo. There's something about being alone with nature that just calls to me. It's like a reset button, a way to clear your head of the city's clutter. So I packed my rugged old Ford with camping essentials and set off to a secluded spot I had heard might provide a more unplugged experience. The place had this postcard perfect beauty, all untouched wilderness and crystal clear water. You don't really appreciate the silence until you're out there in the middle of nowhere with nothing to keep you company but the rustling leaves. It was just me, my camping gear, and the peaceful solitude of nature. I spent most of the afternoon setting up camp. There was comfort in the familiarity of it, the systematic manner of preparing for a night under the endless blanket of stars. As the sky darkened, I got the fire going and started roasting some fresh caught fish. Best meal I had all week. The quiet rustle of the forest, the crackling fire, and the chill in the air painted this idyllic picture that seemed almost unreal in its serenity. Just when I was settling into bed, feeling the cool night air against my skin, I heard the crunch of underbrush somewhere behind my tent. Something here was distinctly out of place. Initially, I brushed it off as some nocturnal critter, probably a raccoon or a squirrel going about their business. But then I heard it again, a little closer this time, and it was a little too loud to be ignored. I slept with my hunting knife within arm's reach, but had left my rifle in the truck. I felt a pulse of regret at that moment. Not fear, exactly. I was still of the mind that it was likely a harmless animal, but it was the reassuring weight of the rifle that I missed, after the noises refused to stop. I reluctantly got out of my sleeping bag and decided to investigate. Night had engulfed the campsite now, and although the moon was shining brightly, the tall pines cast long, confusing shadows ahead of me. I squinted in the darkness, trying to make sense of the unfamiliar terrain. That's when I smelled it. There's no comparing that smell to anything else. You know how a butcher shop has that smell of raw meat? Imagine that, but a hundred times worse. Like something had died and had been left to rot. It was a putrid smell of decay that slapped me across the face and twisted my stomach into a knot. I was on full alert then, every sense wired tight, trying to figure out the source of that gut-wrenching odor. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a silhouette moving far in the trees. It was tall and lean and shuffled in a broken manner that no human or animal could replicate. All of a sudden came an ear-piercing screech. Sound of pure agony, it was something between a man's scream and the wail of an injured animal. But in the fleeting moment when moonlight hit the creature, I witnessed something that wasn't meant for human eyes. All I remember is the skull-like face. Two hollow spaces where the eyes should be, and towering antlers silhouetted against the dark sky. The shrieking cry of the creature echoed through the forest, and I was engulfed with a terror that gripped me to the core. I was too stunned to even think of screaming. I did what every rational being would do when terror takes hold. I backed away slowly. I retreated towards the safety of my vehicle, never taking my eyes away from the monster that lurked at the fringes of my campsite. As it moved, its skeleton-like body seemed to glide effortlessly through the shadows, the figure of an elk-like creature with long legs. But the strangest thing was its head. It bore an uncanny resemblance to the skull of a deer, complete with antlers mounted atop a skeletal frame. The antlers looked eerily familiar, yet completely wrong at the same time, like a cross between an elk and a deer. As the moon fell onto those hollow eyes, chilling glow seeped through the empty sockets. They glowed with the coldest red I've ever seen. It was like staring into the gaping mouth of hell itself. The sight twisted my stomach, my nostrils still filled with that awful, deathly smell. For a moment, we locked eyes, the beast and I. There was something deeply wrong about that look, something that spoke to the depths of our primitive, instinctual fears. That moment felt like an eternity, and it felt like the forest held its breath along with me. Then, just as quickly as it appeared, it moved on. The strange beast turned and slipped away into the blackness. 
the rustling of its footfalls gradually dying until silence reigned once again. I hightailed it to my truck, locked the doors, and didn't move an inch until the first rays of dawn painted the sky. I couldn't sleep. All I could see whenever I tried to close my eyes were those glowing red hollows. The terror still clung to me, raw and present, but the urgency had faded. The creature, whatever it was, was gone. Only the echoes of dread and the lingering, revolting smell remained. I quickly packed up my gear, cutting the trip short. Better safe than sorry, you know. Looking back, what unsettles me the most is the shattering of my understanding of the world. We live with certain truths, with an understanding of what resides in the realms of possibles. The encounter I had that night, the Wendigo, if that's what it was, tosses those perceived truths out the window. I couldn't bring myself to venture alone into the wilderness for a while after the encounter. This creature I encountered disrupted the harmony of my universe, introducing an element of terror into the domain I had always found tranquility in. Now, I know different. There are things in this world we don't understand. Whether we want to believe they are real or not is another story entirely.